Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. We are joined on the program now by Carol Platt-Libau, president of the Yankee Institute, to take a closer look at President Biden's decision not to run in November. Carol, thank you very much for being with us. Does it surprise you uh, at all that many in the Democratic Party are falling in here behind Kamala Harris rather than calling for a contested convention? I mean, it feels like an anointment. We don't do anointments in the U.S., Um, No, generally we don't. But given the lateness of the hour and the closeness of the Democratic National Convention, it starts just four weeks from tomorrow. I believe the party feels as though it has very little option other than to move ahead with the vice president. So I think it's safe to say that the most important thing that we will encounter next is uh, Kamala Harris's choice for a running mate. I mean, is there thinking that you could share? I mean, how would a strategy unfold if she were to look at it strategically? Well, Kamala Harris, I think probably, or at least the people around her, understand that she comes into this race with, you know, a obviously some advantages that Joe Biden doesn't have. In other words, um, youth and a certain dynamism and a, a certain excitement factor for certain elements of the party, given that she is younger, given that she will be the first woman of color to head a major party ticket, but that she also has certain disadvantages. Um, she obviously is a San Francisco liberal uh, heading a ticket, and she's going to realize that she is going to need to bring some some of the appeal that President Biden was understood to have, uh, something that that will help bring people from the Rust Belt, the blue wall, uh, blue collar male voters, hopefully hold them uh, whatever's left of the old New Deal coalition. And so she will be looking at more moderate male candidates, in my opinion, people like Andy Bashir, governor of Kentucky, Roy Cooper, the governor of North Carolina, Josh Shapiro, the mm-hmm. governor of Pennsylvania. But I don't believe he actually will have a shot in the end, um, given the divisions in the Democratic Party over support for Israel these days. And the, the, the one to watch, and I believe the smart bet should be on Senator Mark Kelly of Arizona. Arizona is a swing state. Mark Kelly is a former astronaut, and his wife, of course, is Gabrielle Giffords, who was injured in a a horrific gun violence accident. And he's the one where I think the smart money should be. Uh, You know, this whole process removes some of the uncertainties, but it obviously raises a lot of questions. We've just talked about a few of them. And another question is, there are many key voices in the Democratic Party who have not weighed in yet with support for uh, the vice president to step up. Uh, Do you think that will get resolved or do you think that that eventually means that there will be a little bit more uh, back and forth on this? I don't think Democrats will go to their convention uh, with an open convention on the table in anything but name, uh, because they understand just how potentially catastrophic that could be, especially given uh, the fact that emotions can run high. And, you know, everyone saw what happened the last time a Democratic convention was held in Chicago back in 1968. And so right now, of course, Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer have not endorsed Kamala Harris. This isn't because uh, necessarily they don't want her as the candidate, in my view. Uh, Barack Obama in particular has long been a mentor to Kamala Harris. And in Mm. fact, He is the one who's largely responsible for Joe Biden having picked her in the first place. The reason, in my view, that Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama have not spoken up on her behalf or or indicated um, an endorsement of her is because having touted themselves as the party of democracy for the past three and a half years, it does look rather unseemly if Mm. having essentially 
kept other candidates out of an actual Democratic primary and having given Dean Phillips, a backbench congressman who ran on the grounds that Joe Biden was having certain mental issues, a very hard time for having participated. It now seems rather unseemly if the Democrats rush to anoint a candidate and make it look as though it's simply an oligarchic situation here. Is there a way in which uh, Vice President Harris needs to pivot away uh, from the policies of the Biden administration and maybe differentiate herself in a unique way? Well, it's going to be very difficult for her to do that um, in, in a lot of ways, given that she really is, you know, Joe Biden's vice president. And she has been there, presumably, as his partner for the past three and a half years. And so the, the Biden administration really has governed in uh, uh, really at the left side of the political spectrum for the past three and a half years. And Kamala Harris finds herself on the left side of the Democratic Party. It mm. is going to be very difficult for her to find places to distinguish herself um, in a way that would not involve moving right, which is something that she's not likely to fi be very comfortable doing. And she could not highlight differences with the president while the president continues to serve and she continues to serve as the vice president. So I guess the follow on question from that, uh, in your view, would it actually be better for the Democratic Party and Kamala Harris if President Biden were to step down now? Actually, for Kamala Harris politically, that would be optimal in a lot of ways because it gives the country uh, a visual. It lets her step into the shoes of the president and it lets her let everyone it, it gives her the visual and it gives her everything she needs to start, start serving as president right away. And uh, and 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 that can only be helpful to her. The timing is very interesting. I mean, obviously, the GOP just wrapped up uh, its convention in Milwaukee. Now we have Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu scheduling to land in the U.S. Uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Can you set the what we've witnessed today in the context, the timeline that has been unfolding? Well, most of the timeline has been driven by the fact that it's getting very close in terms of uh, a ballot requirements in various states. And if Democrats had waited much longer, if Joe Biden had waited much longer to make this decision, there could have been ballot access challenges brought by Republicans in various states, some of which are swing states. And that's not to say that necessarily those challenges would have prevailed, but it could have made things a lot more dicey in terms of of uh, legal challenges to whomever the nominee ultimately was. Yeah. And so just given what they need to do also to get ballots printed in practical terms, time was upon them. This had to yeah. happen if it was going to happen. The Republicans are trumpeting that the Democrats are very beatable now that they've been in disarray. But we should remember that former President Trump looked himself very beatable when he was a convicted felon uh, on 34 accounts. But then he did rebound. Do you think the Democrats can rebound from here or is the die cast? Very quickly. Uh, uh, the die is never cast. The vote happens over a period of weeks, of course, but nothing is done until it's done. And ultimately, the American people are the ones who make the decision. Right. OK, well, uh, Carol, thanks very much for being with us. Carol Platt Leibau, uh, president of the Anki Institute with us. President Biden not seeking re-election. Joining us now from just outside San Francisco is Brandis Keynes Roan, professor of political science at Stanford University, where she is senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Brandis, thank you so much for being with us. Can I begin by just getting your reaction to these dramatic events that, as Brian mentioned, have just unfolded in about the last five hours or so? Yes. Uh, on the one hand, it seemed increasingly likely that Biden would drop out. On the other hand, uh, I don't know that everyone expected it to be today or even tomorrow or even uh, this week. And uh, you may have seen that many of his own aides responded. They were learning from X, you know, formerly known as, as Twitter. 
Um, so this was not uh, an event that everyone was predicting uh, to happen just at this moment. Brandis, do you see a particular trigger for this move or was it just sort of the cumulative weight of advice from those around the president? Well, it's, uh, you know, the Democrats, um, if you had uh, asked me a few months ago, what position would they like to be in? They would like to know that Trump is the nominee in the sense of that's who they're competing against um, and that he won't be replaced by a different Republican and then be able to replace Biden with someone who they thought might uh, be uh, do even better uh, against Trump. And so while on the one hand, I don't have private information suggesting there was a particular conversation today that pushed Biden and his family uh, over the edge. Uh, the timing certainly suggests that, you know, Trump is the nominee. He's now been formally nominated by the Republicans. So they're in uh, a position that I think many would have said they'd like to be in, in in many respects. So if we can agree then at the GOP convention last week, there was a strategy going forward, the assumption being that Donald Trump and Joe Biden would be going head to head in this race. Now it would seem as though the Trump campaign has to make a little bit of a pivot here. If you were advising them, what would they need to do next? Uh, they certainly need to think about how this shifts uh, the coalition a bit and how some of the, uh, you know, some of the things that the Trump campaign uh, was probably counting on was not just uh, sort of pivotal voters or swing voters, uh, maybe uh, leaning more towards Biden, but they were counting on a lack of enthusiasm and lower turnout. And of course, all of that remains to be seen um, with who we presume will be the nominee um, with Kamala Harris. But, um, you know, the sense that um, there was a sense that uh, young voters would, would be even more likely than usual to stay home. Uh, there was increasing evidence that many underrepresented minorities, such as black Americans, were not as enthusiastic. Um, the Trump campaign has to now update in terms of those turnout expectations. I wonder whether or not the vice president's hands will be tied a little bit in in terms of trying to differentiate herself from the president, because she's still serving as vice president. Uh, and, uh, you know, from your experience, uh, w will she be able to carve out a new direction? For instance, uh, could we see a, a gap between her policy toward China, for instance, than the president's? I think that's a great question. And what I think we'll see is um, perhaps some movement on issues, particularly, um, and, and China would be one of them, but there'll be movements that are then supported by Biden himself, at least publicly, right? There, I don't foresee a huge breach in the sense of I'm a part of, because in some ways she can't run as a part of the Biden administration and who's helped formulate many of the policies but presidents update policies all the time, particularly in areas such as foreign affairs uh, due to new, uh, new developments. And so that can be packaged in a way, particularly if it's an incremental move. So right now, the betting markets are indicating the probability of Trump winning in November. It took a small move lower, although I think that he does remain at this point the clear favorite. Yes. Is there a period of time that you would want to elapse before polling data would reliably begin to reflect how um, Kamala Harris would be received uh, in the election in November? Absolutely. Um, and one of the one of the things I, I assume that Biden himself, to the extent that these reports that he was resisting stepping down, uh, would know very well from his long years in politics, is that often there are these movements after a debate uh, or after a convention that favor a particular candidate, but then the fundamentals tend to return. That's what all of the political science evidence suggests, um, that those are usually uh, very temporary events. And so I'm sure he was thinking, look, we know this. And so, um, and with Kamala, we both wanna see um, how she's received now. And, and of course, she's not the official nominee yet, but let's say that within a week, it becomes, as you pointed out yeah. earlier in this uh, session, she's increasingly uh, seen as the likely nominee, um, how yeah. she's received, but also how these post-debate, post-Republican convention bounces kind of come to earth. 
Brandis, I'm advised I need to ask you a very short question, uh, okay. and you won't be able to answer it. But who wins in November? <laughs> 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 I think it's about I think we do want you asked me how long I think we want a week or two before we make strong predictions on that. <laughs> Brandis Keynes wrong, um, professor of political science at Stanford University, where she is senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. James Zabate, managing director and chief investment officer at Center Asset Management. James, thank you for joining us. What is the single most important issue for the presidential election that's coming up? And is it, you know, is it more about character or is it something that would be in the business and finance uh, area? Well, I think what happened today raises the uncertainty level uh, to a great degree. The knee-jerk reaction of a lot of pundits has been that this is analogous somehow to Lyndon Johnson in 1968 when he dropped out. People have to remember, though, that Johnson dropped out of the race in March 1968 when the primaries were still underway. It's not like today where all the delegates that have been pledged are there and the convention, which takes place on, you know, starts on August 19th, um, you know, allows that to basically unfold. You know, what you have is essentially an environment where it still can be an open race. Uh, I'm not so sure Harris is the one who actually gets the the nod here to a certain degree. Um, you could have essentially an environment where, because the way the Democratic primary is set up and the, the number of super delegates that they have, uh, all you need is uh, essentially, you know, those super delegates representing a third of the amount to get the, uh, get the nomination. But I think, you know, when you look at it from positives and negatives, you know, the, the sad part of this whole thing is it highlights, you know, how the post Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court shows that, you know, a very small group of billionaires can kind of cut off the uh, purse strings and change elections to a great degree. On a positive side, however, is that, you know, maybe we'll see a campaign on issues rather than just cults of personalities, right? I mean, let's see who wins. The Republicans running on the platform of 1888 versus the Democrats running on the platform of 1968. Well, it seems clear in terms of economic policy, if you look at what the GOP is advocating, increased tariffs, uh, tax cuts. I mean, so the contrast seems pretty sharp. What's your point of view here on uh, what this means for markets? Let's imagine right now that the betting markets have it right and Donald Trump has a real strong chance of regaining power. Has the market fully discounted the Trump presidency? Well, I think if you look at just the action last week where we had a significant rotation into small caps, cyclicals, banks, I mean, what that was indicating at least was that we were going to avoid a soft landing. Um, you're going to see earnings recover. The economy essentially go from a sideways movement to acceleration, and you'd see this continuing rotation from the Magnificent Seven, which really have garnered all the attention because that's where the earnings power has been. Uh, towards a broadening out of the market towards cyclicals and small caps in particular. I think what this does is it raises that level of uncertainty as to whether or not we're going to go back to a 2016-2017 type of environment of trading where people will give the benefit of the doubt that we are not late cycle, but we're early cycle, and small caps will be the beneficiaries of that earnings acceleration, which frankly doesn't reconcile with what the economic backdrop uh, is in reality. So that uh, sort of rotation that we saw last week was, uh, unfortunately, to, to put it kind of bluntly, uh, seemed like it was out of quality into weaker quality names. Well, right. The things that would benefit from both the Fed cutting interest rates, which would alleviate the interest rate burden for many smaller companies who are more indebted, but also a broadening out of earnings. I mean, the reason why the Magnificent Seven have done so well is and now represent a third of the S&P 500 is that's where essentially all of the earnings growth has come from. In fact, even if you look at buybacks, just looking at Apple alone, it accounts for 10% of all the dollar value of the buybacks over this past year. But as active managers, you really have to make a decision. If you want to distinguish yourself from benchmarks, there's really three paths you can go on. You could stick with the Magnificent Seven and say this was a correction, and these numbers, these names are going to continue to work well. The rotation, or second, is that the rotation that we saw, small caps, cyclicals, banks, uh, are basically going to take the baton now of leadership. That really relies upon 
a very significant acceleration in the economy, a big alleviation in the interest rate burden by the Fed reducing rates significantly. <clears throat> the third, which I think is the winning path, is actually Treasury bonds, gold, infrastructure and utility stocks, and then classic defensive growth stocks like staples and healthcare. Um, I think those are the names and, and those are the asset classes that are going to preserve capital better in the environment going forward. So if you're being so defensive, I mean, are you also assuming that we're going to see a meaningful slowdown in the economy? I think we continue to go sideways. And the problem is, if you look at expectations of earnings growth, you look out to the fourth quarter of 2024, you've got 5% top lines growth but 15% earnings growth, and that's consistent with what you have in the first quarter of 2025. It's, 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 it's not really what's happening from a perspective of, you know, no soft landing, no recession, and a rapid acceleration of economy in expectations. Because when you look at the yield curve, it's indicating continuing recession, earnings slowdown. We're now seeing the unemployment rate. SOMS rule, which indicates recession. And when we look bottom up, I mean, where we're seeing opportunities is continuing to be on a bottom up perspective in some of these restructuring stories and some of those classic defensive stocks. And I think at some point, the Magnificent Seven is going to run out of steam. Um, I think it's calling the top on the Magnificent Seven this cycle is going to be much more difficult than it was back in 99 and 2000, simply because these companies are actually executing very, very well. But Let's not forget, I think at some point over the next year or two, we're going to get a day when NVIDIA is down 30 or 40 percent on record volume when it announces a flat or negative book to book bill ratio mm. because the buyer's appetite for specialized chips is simply sated. Um, because when you look at the buyers of these chips, Microsoft's now spending two times depreciation. That's double its 25 year median. Meta is spending two and a half times its depreciation. That's at also at a peak. Google or Alphabet spending three times its depreciation, which is two times its its long term median. So you know yeah. that is really the environment that we're going to be in for for I think at some point in time, high risk and magnificent seven. So I think the opportunity set is preservation of capital in bonds, yep. gold, infrastructure, utilities, and staples in healthcare. I get it. A lot of people, a lot of people have already thought that. In fact, we saw Stanley Drunkenmiller get out uh, of Nvidia earlier. The, you know what's evident, too, is that uh, when I looked at it, it looked like he got out somewhere around, say, 500 then, so 50 now, and it's trading at about, what, 117 now. So it's 100% higher than the time that he got out. So it, it, it is a little tricky, but it, it seems like what you're saying is get out while you can, unless you can stump, uh, you know, stomach a 30% drawdown sometimes. Or, or hedge them, um, which is what we would be doing, actually. Yeah, continue to own them, but hedge them. That's probably the sure. better way to approach it. Just briefly, Joe Manchin, uh, you know, did, does, that, um, does that interest you? Does that um, add a new wrinkle here? I, I, I'm not sure. I think you're going to continue to see other people come out of the woodwork here. What, what do they say? That the only thing that satisfies uh, pre presidential ambitions is either winning the office or being horizontal in a coffin, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be, you know, at some point in time, I think you're going to continue to see. And let's not forget these superdelegates with the Democratic Party, you know, you... you they essentially can, you know, make or break uh, someone's nomination. It's going to be exciting. I think it's uh, if you're a political person, this is going to be a very exciting time heading into the convention. Um, that being said, it creates a higher level of uncertainty for investors. I would argue it's more akin towards Bush Gore and hanging Chad. Oh than, no! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then, then actually Johnson dropping out in 1968. So let's talk a little bit about the Fed very quickly before we let you go, James. Uh, PCE at the end of the week. Uh, is there a risk that inflation, I mean, it, although it's come down, that at some point it kind of goes sideways to the to the point you made earlier where things may go sideways and the Fed is perhaps not in a position to cut twice? We get one rate cut between now and the end of the year? Yeah, we've been of the belief all year all year long that the Fed is only going to cut in reaction to further slowdown in economic growth or an increase in the unemployment rate. And what we always remind people of is if you look at the seven cutting cycles, you know, since 1969, the stock market fell on average about 25 percent in the first 200 days after the first Fed rate cut. So be careful what you wish for when you want the Fed to come in uh, and start lowering interest rates. Just briefly, 20 seconds or so, you mentioned uh, you like uh, to be defensive. Any one pick in particular? 
I think if you just look across the Staples Group, you know there are plenty of stocks that are yielding three and a half or four percent across the space. Even in the medical medical technology field, like Medtronic or Zimmer, those are names that I think across the board right now dividend yield is one of the factors that we think will work very well over a period yeah. of time. All right, James, thank you so much. James Abate, Managing Director, Chief Investment Officer at Center Asset Management. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.